Okay. Um, running a little late today, so let's get started. Um, I have the homework of those people who handed in paper. I'll hand that back at the end of the lecture. And the other ones I'll email back uh, the rest of the afternoon after my meetings are done. Okay. Um, okay. So the new homework is out. Okay. The usual caveat applies. Um, I'm not sure exactly how they say this. There's a show, what do you know? What do you the, the, the questions have been carefully researched, but the answers have not. Okay. <laughs> Poorly worded misleading questions are part of the course. Okay. So that means you need to look at these carefully, right? Um, to see if they really make sense. And, um, you know, send email to the list or send email to me if they don't make sense. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about today, lecture seven, cut elimination. Um, so what we're going to do, actually, we're going to, uh, um, we're going to change course. Um, so what we did so far was to introduce linear logic. And then we looked at um, how we can think of proofs in linear logic. Well, first, how to model systems in linear logic. And then um, how linear logic propositions can be introduced as types for sessions. And how proofs can be interpreted as concurrent programs. And how proof reduction can be uh, communication. Okay, so that was a, um, an interpretation of linear logic in terms of uh, communicating processes. So now we're going back to the logic itself, and we're studying questions of proof search. How do you search for a proof in linear logic if you have a theorem that you're trying to prove? Okay. So depending how you look at it, so what would that mean in terms of our process interpretation? If I ask the question, how do I prove a theorem? What would be the interpretation of that task? Yeah? Right, so you're given a specification of, say, an interface, and when you search for a proof, you have to construct a process that actually satisfy that interface, right? So it's sort of like um, automatic program construction or something like this, right? And of course, different proofs will give you different programs. We already saw that last time, right? If I'm supposed to produce something plus one, I can always satisfy this by doing plus one and forget the other stuff, okay? Well, actually, not always, but often. So proofs actually matter, okay? So when we do proof search, we have to be concerned about not just about whether proof exists, but what properties the proof have. So we're, and we're doing mathematics, we're not used to that so much because mostly we're dealing with difficult theorems and the question that's really important is does there exist a proof? But here and also in general in constructive logic, different proofs have different computational behavior so it's very important to understand the deep structure of the proofs and not just whether there is one or not. Okay. And another, another interesting thing will be here, we'll also be concerned with properties of all possible proofs. This is something we don't study in logic very often. So we're not just asking, is there one? And if there is one, how does it behave? But you want to characterize all the possible proofs and have see some properties that all the possible proofs have in common. Okay. And you'll see applications of that as we move along and then use the proof search procedures. Okay, so I think a lot of you in the last homework, okay, um, already made some informal arguments about when proofs do not exist. Because, um, um, so this was actually a misinterpretation of my question, okay. So I was par for the course, right? It was a poorly worded question, okay, so it was misinterpreted. But um, a lot of people asked, I put two, two uh, possible interactions. So one was A plus B proof C, and the other one was A arrow B plus C, okay? And the question was whether there's an interaction law for this, if this can be rewritten some other way, and whether this can be rewritten some other way, okay? And a bunch of the interpreters saying is, are these two things equivalent? Okay, which is not the question I was asking, okay? Um, and I showed you last time, I believe, that uh, this is actually equivalent to, um, no, actually this one. Does anybody remember what it was? A lolly C with B lolly C. Okay, so, um, 
So these two things are equivalent because we can take the A plus B on the left and we can turn it in you know, a width sort of on the outside. Um, but, but this thing is not equivalent to, um, so what would be the natural thing to try to prove this equivalent to? A lolly B. Well, I wouldn't say width here. That seems questionable because when you assume A, then you have to prove B or C, okay? And you might guess that it might be similar to proving that you have A arrow B or A arrow C, right? Okay. So that was a conjecture, and a lot of you kind of correctly saw that that wasn't true, that this didn't hold, okay? Um, so let's think about it, uh, this direction from here to here. Does that hold? If we assume this and we try to prove that. Yes, that holds, okay. So how does the proof work? You know, let's just talk through. So. We do a case on the plus, right? That's our assumption. So we distinguish two cases. In the one case we get from A we have to, uh, we get B and we have to prove this, okay? Um, how do we do that? Well, we use the right rule for this. We assume A, we have to prove B plus C. Then we use the A in order to get this, get the B, and then we say, okay, it's gonna be B plus C, okay? We can think of also this as a concurrent program, if you will, okay? So if you have this thing as a resource, um, you can realize this, okay? So what would this concurrent program do? So we have we assume we're given this, the turnstile points in a weird direction, and we're trying to construct that. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, um, we can input an A, right? Um, so that we can start with that because we're supposed to input an A because we're offering the service. And now we have to tell our client first in left or in right, and then we have to offer B or C, okay? That's our process interpretation. Now we have input to something of type A. Now we can ask our server, is this gonna be the case of this one? So if the server responds with A, A implies B, then we give it the thing that we input here, we get back a B out, and then we tell our client, okay, it was on the left, and then we give it B, okay? Um, and if our server supplies, uh, replies with that, then we still give it A, and then we say it was in right, and then give it C, okay? So there's a program that realizes that, and we already know that giving a program is the same as giving a proof, right? So you can choose whichever one you like, however you like to think about it, it's really the same thing, okay, because we have a bijection. Okay. But in this direction, from here to here, we cannot prove that. So let's think about it, why we cannot build a process that if you have this, okay, um, okay, would do that. So the, we say, I'm claiming there's no process which, which can do that, okay. Um, Okay, so anybody have an intuitive argument? A number of you wrote this, yeah? Uh, um, because you have to predict uh, which kind of service it will provide before handling the token. Right, there's a, kind of a, there's a kind of an issue about which state changes first, right? And the problem is you're in a bind. So you're offering the service, right? So you have to tell your client either this or this. It's your choice, you can make up whichever. You can tell your client, oh, okay, it's this one, or you can tell your client it's this one because you're providing that service. But the problem is that you don't really know which one because you first have to ask your server, right, if the server is gonna provide you with B or C, right? If the server, if given A gives you B, then it's supposed to be this one. If you give the server an A and gives you a C, then it's gonna be this one, okay? But the problem is you can't give the server an A yet because you don't have it because you have to wait first, okay? You have to tell it first whether you wanted this or you want that, okay? So there's no process that you can write there that would do this for you, okay? Because the, two, the choice that the server has to make, okay, um, has to come before the choice that you have to make, okay? So you're stuck, okay? Now that's an informal argument, but it's not really a proof that this cannot be actually shown in general. Okay, so the technology that we're working towards now in today's lecture and then in a couple of other lectures is to actually be able to prove, okay, that this thing cannot be, in, uh, you know, unless you know something about A, B, and C, which we assume we don't, okay, we cannot prove this. Okay, there's no way to prove that. Um, okay, so some people actually wrote down informally why they thought this can't be proven, okay. 
So the argument is something like this. Um, so, so we have a arrow b plus c, and we're trying to prove a arrow b plus a arrow c. Okay. So now we start the argument as follows. Well, there this is a top connective here. This is a top connective here. So there's two rules which you can apply, right? We could try the implication left rule, or we could apply actually three rules, right? One of the or right rules, either the first one or the second or right rule. Okay. Now let's see. If we try to use the implication left rule, what happens? Anybody remember what the implication left rule looks like? We have to prove an A from some of the resources, and then we get to assume B plus C from the remaining resources. Okay, we split our resources. Okay, so unfortunately we have no other resources, so our attempt to prove A will fail because one premise will just say we have to prove A without any resources. Okay? And we won't be able to do that. Okay? So, um, so we can't apply the implication left rule. Now, let's try the or right rule. Let's do the first one. So now we would be proving this would be the same. And now we have to prove A implies B. OK, so again, if we try to prove the right rule here, we get stuck. And the left rule for this will get stuck, right? Because we have no other resources, and we won't be able to prove A from no resources. So we have to prove the right, we have to use the right rule, which is good. So we have A, B plus C. And we also have A, and we're trying to prove B. So now we can't break down this because we make no assumptions about it. We make no assumptions about A. So the only thing we can apply now is the left rule for implication. Great? OK. So the first premise will be to prove A. And then we get to assume B plus C OK, to prove B. Now, what are the resources? Well, this A has to go to the left. Otherwise, we won't be able to prove A. So you must put that here. Um, and now from B plus C, we have to prove B. Intuitively, this is meaningless because we're guaranteed by some, some server that we have B, B or C, and we're trying to prove B. Right? But formally, how do you see that? Well, there's only one rule we can apply, which is the plus left rule. Okay? And so we get two sub goals. From B, we can prove B. And the other one from C, we can prove B. And the second part will fail because we don't make any assumptions about B or C. Okay. All right. So in this generality, for arbitrary A, B, and C, we shouldn't be able to prove this. Okay. Now, that argument has one fatal flaw. Okay. I don't know if anybody sees it. Why, what I just showed you, why isn't that a proof that you can't do it? Yes. Okay. So the big problem is the following. The cut rule looks like this from delta delta prime to prove some c, you can find some lemma and then use that lemma. Okay? So the problem is that you can always apply this rule, okay, no matter what your conclusion is. Okay? And so this argument only holds. For example, I said the last rule must be the implication left or one of the two or right rules. But that was actually false. It could have been cut. right? And maybe if you had some kind of a clever lemma, you would be able to do it. You would be able to prove that lemma from A implies B or C. And then using that, um, okay, maybe with no other resources, you would be able to prove that. Okay. So if we have this cut rule, um, then the problem is that proof search is extremely difficult okay, if you try to follow the rules. Okay, because this rule introduced a huge amount of non-determinism. Yeah? Can't you then have the argument that if you had a cut, then you could get rid of the cut. You could, you know, use smaller cuts, and eventually, like, you'd have to end up with something that looks like this, but you can't do that. Exactly. So that's why the I mean, yeah, that's why the lecture is called cut elimination. Great. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to try to show now is that if there is a proof that uses this rule, there's also a proof that doesn't use it. Okay. So that doesn't character, you know, so there's some issue there about <coughs> characterizing the set of proofs very precisely. But basically what that would say is we never, we don't have to consider this rule when we do this reasoning, okay? Because if there's a proof with this rule, there's another proof without it, okay? And the basic idea of the argument was concerned, was already containing your question, okay? So we already know if this, if this A is a compound formula, okay, like if it's, 
um, A tensor B, and this is the right rule and this is the left rule, we know how to reduce it to cut at smaller types, right? That's the cut reduction, okay? Um, and the important part is that it's a cut at a smaller proposition or a smaller type, okay? Um, because if you, you need some kind of induction to show that you can really get rid of all the cuts. And so you need something to get smaller when you eliminate it, right? And we already seen that one cut turns into two, right? Like an A tensor B, cut at A tensor B turns into one at A and one at B. And so the number of cuts is not a good measure, but it has to be something about the type of the cut that gets smaller when you do that, okay? All right, so this is, this is the basic idea, but there are some issues, okay, when you try to do that. So, um, so the basic problem is that if you are lucky, and this is like, say, a tensor right, and this is the tensor left on A, then we know how to reduce it, okay? Um, because we know that, um, um, well, we have checked it, right, for all the connectives, that we can always do that. But the problem is that um, what if this is a tensor here and this is a tensor here, and maybe the last rule actually, this C1 was an implication, the last rule was applying this to C, and it didn't actually at, at, uh, address what happened to A, okay? So that question we did not answer, what happens in that case. We did not answer the question what happens if this thing is also a cut. So you have one cut and you have another cut in one of the two pieces. So we didn't address these questions yet. We only checked that if the right rule meets the left rule for the same connective, we can reduce it by what happens in general. So that's what the lecture is about, what happens in general. Okay. Um, but I hope you can see that once we show that this rule is never needed, if you want to show if there's a proof, Okay, then this argument that we did here holds. Okay, and then in fact, we c that's the proof here, that the thing that I talked through, that this thing does not in general entail this. Okay, because we followed all the possible rules. We don't have to consider cut anymore because it can always be eliminated. Okay, um, and then we eventually get stuck along each branch. Okay, everybody on board with that? Okay. So the question is now, how do we eliminate cut in general? Okay, so the way we're gonna do this, um, so we're gonna break the problem down into smaller pieces. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is, we're gonna have a new system, okay? And I'm gonna write it like, uh, write it here. Okay, like this, okay? And what that means is that uh, there's a proof of A from delta which is cut free. Okay? Um, and I'm just writing that like this, that I don't always have to say there's a cut free proof, there's a proof is cut. It gets confusing, though let's have different notation for the two things. Okay? So the way we're going to proceed, okay, this is, uh, turns out to be an elegant way to do it is we're gonna say if I have a cut-free proof for the left-hand side and a cut-free proof for the right-hand side, then I can get a cut-free proof for the conclusion, okay? So that's the proof technique. So let me write this out. That is not everything, but it will get us 95% of the way. So if delta proves A and delta prime and A proves C, then delta, delta prime proves C, okay? So this is the theorem that we want to prove, okay? And after we've done that, then we have to consider what happens when you add gammas, right? So gammas are gonna complicate things. But for now, let's just do it for the pure linear fragment. Let's not do too many things all at once, okay? Now, um, one way to state this, and you'll see this also in the lecture notes, I put that terminology there, uh, we can say that this is a, what we call an admissible rule of inference. Oops. Okay, so we say that this rule is admissible. Does anybody see what's the difference between a derived rule and an admissible rule? Yeah? Right, so something is a derived rule if you have a closed form derivation that has the, the assumptions at the top, right, and then a little proof figure, 
and we have the conclusion at the bottom. Okay. So the nice thing about a derived rule is that if you have a little derivation that from the open assumption you get the conclusion, okay, then no matter what you do to the system, you can add arbitrarily many things. That thing always stays a correct proof. Right? Now with an admissible rule, it could very well be that we prove that this is admissible. We add a new connective and now it's no longer admissible because maybe our proof was incorrect or maybe we added a bad connective. Okay? So the nice thing about the right rule of inference is that they're stable under all extension of the system. Okay, we don't have to worry about that. Admissible rules, we have to reconsider every time we extend our system, we have to reconsider, is this rule really still admissible or have we changed something in the properties of our system? Okay. So that's the thing to keep in mind. If you can actually derive a rule, great, do it. Because you know, once you've proven it, you never have to come back to it. It's always there. If you have an admissible rule, you always have to have in the back of your mind. Oh, well, if I do that, is that rule that I really need it, okay, still admissible, okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so we want to prove this rule admissible, and this is the main piece. Um, maybe we should do the second step now, just, just to see how we're going to use that. Um, so the question is, once we know this rule is admissible, then we want to prove something else, which is a, basically a corollary of this. Okay. Um, so what we want to prove is that if... So that's uh, another theorem. If in delta, um, yeah, A, then delta A in this way. So we have an arbitrary proof that uses cut, okay? Then there exists also cut-free proof, okay? Um, okay, so let's think about this one first. Before you invest a lot of time in proving a lemma, okay, it's usually a good thing to check that it actually implies the theorem that you want. Okay. Um, and if you did it right, okay, it should be quick. Right? So how do we actually do this? Assuming that we have proven that it's admissible. Yeah? Induction over the derivation of the cut hole proof. Okay, exactly. So we do induction over derivation of the proof with cut. Okay, and we hope that in each case we can construct that one. So this is a nice illustration of this imp very important principle that we use in proof theory all the time, which is induction over the structure of a proof, okay, which is what we need here. So let's call this D, okay, and let's call this E. Uh, actually, let me call it F because it uh, makes it easier later on, okay. So proof by induction on the structure of D, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to exam, examine all cases of D and see can we construct the corresponding proof over on the right-hand side, okay? All right, so let's do, let's do a case. So if D is, let's say case, D is a proves A because that's the identity at A. Okay, how do we construct that? It's the same thing because we have the same rule. Um, a arrow A, also by identity in this other system of A. Okay. All right, you can see that because these share the same rules except for one rule, you're going to be done in each case in just a single step. Right? So for example, one more case. If this was um, uh, delta 1, delta 2 proves A tensor B because delta 1 proves A, uh, okay, let me call this A1 and A2, and delta 2 proves A2, so this is called D1 and this is called D2, okay, how do we proceed in that case? Anton? We apply the induction hypothesis to these two, so we get an F1, which is proof of delta 1, I get A1. We get an F2 from delta 2, I get A2. And then I use the same rule again, which was tensor R. And I get delta 1 together with delta 2 proves A1 tensor A2. 
Okay? So the proof is completely mechanical because in each case, you just apply the same rule that you had here because it's still the same rule exists over here using the induction hypothesis that they're really the same judgment. Make sense? Okay, there's only one thing where you have to worry about something. Only one case where it's not totally mechanical. Cut, right? Because that's the difference between the two systems. So let's write that case down. If over here we have a cut rule, so delta breaks into delta 1 and delta 2 proves A because delta 1 proves B and delta 2 together with B proves A. And we use cut at B. Okay. All right, so how do we proceed now? Okay, so we again apply the induction hypothesis delta 1 proves B. Whoops, yeah, in this way, okay. We'll apply it over the second assumption. Delta 2 together with B, we get a cut-free proof of A. And now? Now we use that lemma over there, the theorem over there, which we haven't proven yet. So with our new fancy notation, okay, that, and we're done, okay? So that proof is laughably easy, right? Okay, which is good because we want all proofs to be easy, right? So the goal of this, you know, this whole exercise of proof theory is to design the system in such a way that all the proofs are easy. There should never be anything hard. If there's something really hard, then there's probably some kind of bug somewhere. Okay. Um, and so indeed, this proof is easy. You just have to realize that you want to organize it this way. That you prove that in the cut-free system, cut is admissible. And then it's a very simple induction over the structure of the proof with cut to get the proof without cut. Okay. Um, this isn't quite sufficient for some applications. So for example, in our session types for concurrent processes, okay, um, we might want to prove something stronger. We might want to be able to prove, for example, that no matter how the processes continue to interact, they will always reach some kind of a normal form. This theorem only says that if there is a proof that was cut, then there's another one that doesn't have cut, but it doesn't say whether you can always get from here to here by computation. And it doesn't say whether any way of going from here will give you this. Because as contained in this proof is a particular strategy for taking a proof and coming up with one that doesn't have cut anymore. Okay? In a proof that doesn't have cut, it means that the process has no interacting processes because the interaction okay, in the process calculus comes from the cut rule. right? So basically, if you get a proof here which doesn't have cut, it means that no further computation steps can take place. So the cut-free proofs correspond to processes that can no longer interact any further, okay? Because interaction comes from the cut rule, and we have eliminated the cut rule, okay? Okay, so, um, but for our purpose of proof search, this is enough in some sense, even though it doesn't, it's not enough necessarily for our uh, concurrent interpretations, okay? So the question here is now, okay, how do we prove that thing over there? Okay. Oh, this proof, everybody's okay. Structural induction on proofs. Okay. So we have to consider for each case, you know, um, whether, uh, you know, we can apply the induction hypothesis to the premises in order to get the conclusion um, down there. And um, yeah, so it's a, we'll use structural induction many times. So we'll get a lot of practice in doing that. So, now we have dispensed with that. Yes, it would be big enough, uh, good enough a theorem to get our conclusion. So now let's go back and see if we can prove that theorem. Okay. Um, suggestion on how to proceed. Okay, so this is a case where we have three things given as inputs. We're given one proof here, let's call this D, and another proof here, let's call this E, and we have to construct this F, and we're also given the formula A. So we have three different inputs. So when you look at this problem, a priori, it's not clear where you're going to do your induction, right? It's not so obvious because you have three things. 
In the other proof that we had, right, basically we had just one thing, which was given this as a proof. We had to construct another. So immediately the suggestion is induction of the structure of the proof. We have three things, two proofs and a formula. So not obvious how to proceed, yeah? Yeah, we're given C also. Yeah, so we're given four things. I'm giving the game away. We don't really need to analyze structure of C. Okay. So, but, um, so the thing to do if you don't know how to do the induction, okay, is you think about what, if you prove this, there's going to be embedded in the proof, there's some kind of a program um, which takes a proof D and a formula A and a proof E and constructs this one here. Because we're given two proofs and you have to construct another one. The way we're constructing these things, the way we're proving them things is constructively. So we have this idea that a constructive proof corresponds to some program, right? So really, when we write the proof, it's the same thing as writing some kind of a program that takes a proof of that and a proof of that and gives us a proof of that, okay? So these programs turn out, they will not be concurrent programs necessarily, okay, even though that's also a possibility. Um, but think of them as functional programs which take like three inputs, um, you know, these, uh, um, this proof, this proof, and, and, and the formula A and gives you this proof, okay? So one way is to write that program and look at it and see if you can see why it terminates. Because if you cover all the cases and it terminates, then you know you can always produce one of these things if you're given these two. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to do. Write out first exactly how you produce that and worry about the induction measure that you need in order to make sure that it always terminates second. Because once you see how the argument works, that gives you some insight into the why it actually terminates. Okay. So we consider all possible cases, okay? So, um, how many connectives do we have in linear logic? Okay, so we have tensor one with top plus zero, um, bang, linear implication, okay? So how much is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so some of these have more than one rule. So you, if you consider all the possible cases like here and here, okay, you'd have 64 cases, something like that. So that's probably not good for one lecture, okay. Um, so one time, what I did is I did a distributed theorem proving exercise when I taught this class way back when. And the way I did that is I, I put up a web page and there were all the, in this case it turned out to be 256 cases, okay. And you can bid on your favorite case, okay? And then at the, end of the, at the end of the class, we had the proof of the theorem that we wanted because everybody contributed their part, okay? Um, it turns out that if you structure things cleverly, okay, you can actually make this linear in the number of connectives. So now it starts to look more like something you might be able to do reasonably without having to do the crowdsourcing of proofs, okay? Um, um, and we have to be careful of that. Um, okay, so let's look at some of the cases. Uh, what are some easy cases? Yeah? One. One? Okay. Do you mean as a case for... Hmm? A is one? Okay. So then we have delta arrow one and we have delta prime and one proof C. Okay. Not so easy. Uh, no, there's many ways to prove that because there could be lots of rules applied to things in delta and lots applied to things to delta prime and C. So there's many ways to prove that. So it doesn't seem like a good way to organize the overall structure by analyzing what A looks like. That's probably not a good idea, right? Because you have something like this and still there's many, many cases left. So how do we want to organize the proof? Yeah? Um, based on what the last rule in E was. Okay. Based on what the last rule in E and maybe also D. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, okay. So now we want to distinguish on how this was proven, how this was proven. Okay. So what would be an easy case? Okay, exactly. 
if this is a right rule that introduces A, and this is a left rule that introduces A, then we've already done all the work, right? OK, so let's, so case, let's look at one of them. OK, so now I'll come back to, let's do the one case. So if, if, if this was the one right rule, and it's matched up with the one left rule, OK? Um, OK, so this is, if you want to write it out, this is D. This is E. And this thing here is E prime, OK? We have already done all the work, but how do we reduce this? How do we come up with the proof of this? So what is delta and delta prime here? Delta is empty, so it's just delta prime, right? And C, we don't know anything about. So we need a proof F of this. How do we get the proof F? We have it. So that's just E prime, right? OK, good. So it was an easy case if we look at it the right way. OK. So all the cases we already did are the cases where this thing's the right rule introducing A, and this is the left rule, OK, introducing A. And that's the last rule that's applied in D and E. And what gets smaller in these cases is the size of the cut formula, right? Because we always reduce the cut at some compound type to cut at smaller type. We're always careful to do that. OK. So now we have all these cases already taken care of, right? All the cases where they match up in that way. OK, so now what, what are the other cases? Yeah? Um, in the case that we have, we, we reduce a big cut into several smaller cuts. Mm -hmm. um, we might not, I mean, it's possible that the, the, um, the new generation might not be a soft generation. Very important. Right. So we'll have to be aware of that when we try to prove in the end that our program always terminates, that we always come up with an answer, right? Because it could be a recursive program that we're constructing here that might not actually ever produce an F if the new cuts that we need are not smaller than what we started with. So your concern is ex extremely important, and we'll have to come back to that once we have considered all the cases. OK? So just hold on to that thought, and we'll have to come back and see when we're done to see if we're really done. OK, so what are the other cases that we have to consider? The whole insight in this proof is to figure out how to organize the cases. Right? Because one could just say, OK, there are, I don't know, what did I say, eight connectives. So it's probably, I don't know, 12 rules that can be applied here and 12 rules that can be applied here. So let's consider all 144 cases. Right? But there are smarter ways to do that. Any suggestions? Yeah? Well, we have to consider the left rule as opposed to the right on the one side. So. OK. All right. So, OK. So let's look at, in D, you might have applied the left rule to delta. OK? And maybe we can do that, and it doesn't actually matter what E looks like. Because if that's the case, then we reduce the number of cases by dividing by the number of possible rules that this could be used for. OK. So let's check that out. OK. So the case would be. One case would be, let's say it's the um, E is, uh, looks like this. So we have delta 1 together with uh, B implies D. And we prove A. Um, and we do that by delta 1 proves B. And delta 2 together with D proves A, and so this is D1, and this is D2, and E is arbitrary. OK, so we don't distinguish the cases for E. OK? All right, so what do we need to show? Let's make it explicit. Uh, we need to construct a derivation of which there's some F which proves in this particular case. Delta 1. Delta 2, B implies D. Delta prime, delta prime proof C. OK, and these, this whole mess together, right, that's here that was equal to delta, right? So in that particular case, delta splits up in this way. 
OK, how do we get our f? This is the implies left. OK, well, we look at ways to apply cut at something that's smaller than what we had before, right? To apply our induction hypothesis. Where might we be able to do that here? So E is arbitrary, but what is the proof of? E is arbitrary proof of delta prime and A proof C. Right, so we could cut D2 against E, right? Because it's a proof of A and that uses A. And it looks like it might be something smaller because this is the subproof of what we started with, right? We started with D and D2 as a part of that. Okay. So what do we get? Um, so we get delta 2 and D and delta prime proof C. So that's by, okay, um, cut on, on still on A, on D2 and E, right? Okay, so now we have that. Okay, how do we get F from here? Right, so we still have that other derivation, D1, that we didn't use. Okay, so we write that over here. So the proof of D1 is a proof of delta 1 arrow B. And now we can use implication left, and we conclude that delta 1, delta 2, D, no, I'm sorry, B implies D, delta prime, proof C. Okay, what did we need to show? Oh, exactly that. Okay. So the intuition here that if you want to think about this intuition, there's a, there's a cut here between these two things, right? And what we're doing is we're pushing up the cut, cutting with this premise, but the rule stays the same. Okay. So we apply the induction hypothesis and then reapply the same rule. I see that this kind of mechanically how this works. So you'd be pushing up the cut to actually happen here with the premise, and that allows us to reconstitute to prove the conclusion that we want. Okay. Um, okay, so this is what happens here, okay? So this is the same formula, this is the subproof, and this is the same proof that we started with, okay? Now it turns out all the cases that we can possibly think of um, for um, if a left rule is applied in D work the same way. We don't need to look at what E is, okay? Because in each case, we find where A is in the premise, okay? We move the cut up, do a cut with the induction hypothesis, and then we reapply the rule, okay? Um, now, you have to trust me on this, right? Or you can actually write it out yourself, or you can find the paper where this is proven, okay? So there's three options, okay? Um, what's not an option is to go through all the cases here, okay? So you just have to trust me on that. But the nice thing about it is that it doesn't matter what E is, right? So we only have to consider as many cases there as left rules. Okay. All right. So that takes care of all the cases where a D ends in a left rule. So what are the next ones we have to consider? Yeah. So E could end in a right rule on C. Okay. Any guesses what happens there? Yeah? Exactly. We don't need to analyze the structure of D if we do that. Because what we do is we apply the induction hypothesis on the premise. This A has to go somewhere, right? It's a linear. So the A is going to appear somewhere, okay? We apply the induction hypothesis to the premise, and then we reapply whatever rule we had here, okay? So visually, you can think of it as this cut between this and this. There's a rule here that leaves A untouched. You push up the cut into that premise, and then you reapply the rule, okay? Okay, so what if it's a left rule applied to something in delta prime? Then either we had a, a right or a left rule on the other one, in which case one of the other two cases. Um, maybe, maybe not. No, but uh, you don't have to make that complicated. We use the same trick. So we don't consider what D is. If it's a left rule in delta prime, Okay, the A is going to survive that. We just push the cut up. We cut with the premise where A is, 
and then we reapply the left rule on delta prime, and we don't have to consider the case for D. Okay? Okay, so we have three types of cuts so far, and we kind of know how to handle each case. Actually, is it? Yeah, so it's the, a left rule here, and then we don't care what E is. It's a left rule here, we don't care what D is, or it's a right rule here, and we don't care what D is. Okay? Or this was a right rule on A, and this is a left rule on A, and then we also know how to proceed, because we already checked all these cases when we introduced the connectives. Okay, um, okay so that's it. The only other thing we have to worry about is initial sequence, because they don't break down the structure of the proof. Okay, so let's check those cases, and then I think your proof is done. Okay, and we just have to make sure that it actually really is a proof. But let's say this one could be the initial sequence, right? Let, let's check that case. If D was the initial sequence, what would it look like? So D would be A arrow A. So we actually know that the delta is equal to just a singleton A, right? And uh, do we need to analyze what E is? Maybe, maybe not. Well, what is the conclusion we have to show in that case? So delta is A, so we get A delta prime, right? So that's delta, that's delta prime. This A is being cut, and we just get C. So we need to construct a proof of this. Where do we get this from? That's E. Well, so this F, we just pick E, okay? So when this premise is a cut, we just take the other proof. It happens to be the right one, okay? Well, let's do the opposite. What if it E is the initial sequence? or the identity, okay, so E looks like, um, okay, we have A, okay, um, proves A, and that's the identity on A, and over here we have D from delta, we prove A. So what is the conclusion we have to prove? Delta prime is empty, and C is equal to A, right, in this case. So delta prime has to be empty because this A has to be used, and the C has to be equal to A because of that. So what we have to prove here, this is empty, this is A, so we get delta proves A. So that has to be F. How do we get F? Well, we already have D, so that's equal to D, okay? So if it's an initial sequence, if this is initial, we take E. If this is initial, we take D, okay? Okay, so we have all the cases covered, so it looks like we can make something smaller in each possible case, okay? Um, or does it? Okay, so now comes the critical part of this. What is the measure of induction that every time we apply the induction hypothesis really is a smaller thing, okay? Um, so in the cases where there's a left rule applied to something in delta, what is that? What gets smaller in that case? Uh, the of no, not A. The number, of the number of connectives in delta. I'm not going to use that, even though it's true. The derivation, so the derivation, right? The proof gets smaller because we apply the induction hypothesis to the subproof here. If it's a left rule in delta prime, what gets smaller? E. And A stays the same, right? And C stays the same. But E gets smaller, okay? So in those cases, when we, have, when we push the cutout past the last inference rule, the cut formula A stays the same, okay? And either the left proof gets smaller, the other one stays the same, or the right proof gets smaller, and the left one stays the same. You see that? That's what's happening there, okay? Okay, so if the cut formula stays the same, we have to reduce one of the two proofs to a smaller proof. When we actually break down the cut because the right rule of A meets the left rule of A, yeah, then what happens? Yeah? I mean, actually, I was talking about that. Okay. The, the yeah. Cut, uh, the cut reduction relies on the smaller A. Right. The cut reduction relies on the formula A getting smaller. And that's important because one cut might turn into two, right? If it's tensor, a cut at A tensor B turns into two cuts. So the proof doesn't necessarily get smaller because now we have a proof, you know, which has a cut in it, which we have to eliminate. We get something back from the induction hypothesis might be very large. We don't know what it is, okay? But we're actually okay because the cut formula gets smaller. So what emerging is here we have a lexicographic induction or a nested induction. So nested induction.
on A, the proof D, and the proof E. And by nested induction, I mean in the following way. Either A gets smaller, it decreases, and then D and E are arbitrary. Okay, we don't care what happens to D and E. They could be larger as long as the formula gets smaller. Okay, or A stays the same, and uh, D stays the same, and E decreases. Okay, or A is the same, uh, and D becomes smaller, and E stays the same. Okay, and so we claim that under this kind of induction ordering, um, you know, what will always come down essentially out of the base case at the end. Okay, that this is a well-founded ordering. Why is that? Um, well, we can do these two things only a finite number of times because the proofs get always smaller, right? D can get smaller sometimes, E can get smaller sometimes, but eventually both D and E have to get down to being empty, okay? Or we have to appeal to the first case, right? If these two get down to the base case, then we don't have to necessarily consider A getting smaller, then we're done anyway. But if we stop here, then A gets smaller. Now D and E can become very large, potentially, okay? But it doesn't matter because as D and E can now decrease, A doesn't become smaller. Okay. Uh, a, do, a cannot increase. Okay. So um, if you want to formulate this in terms of an induction order, you would say a lexicographic ordering, where you compare two triples, uh, first on A, and if A stays the same, then you compare the, the pair of proofs D and E. Okay. So that's what's going on in this proof. So it's pretty, turns out to be relatively a uh, standard kind of thing that we have this kind of nested induction. So you'll see the term nested induction for this, or you see the, the term lexicographic induction. Okay. So first on the structure of the formula A, and if A stays the same, then the proofs on the two sides have to decrease. We have to be careful, for example, it's not okay for when E decreases for D to get bigger if, um, if the other case, it happens the other way around, right? Because then they could go back and forth Okay, and they don't actually decrease down to zero. But D stays the same, and E gets smaller, and when D decreases, then E stays the same. So they'll have to go both down at some kind of asynchronous way, but eventually they have to bottom out in the size. Okay, so this is very nice, okay, and one of the nice things about linear logic is that this is so very simple and nice, right? I mean, it's, it's clean, it's easy. Okay, I can do it in a lecture. Lots of heads are nodding. Okay, so, okay, we can do that. Now, of course, we have to worry about bang, okay? So now uh, things get more complicated. Um, and I'm probably not gonna do it in exactly the same level of detail, but we'll have to worry about what actually happens there, okay? By the way, with this theorem just for the linear part, we have a very easy proof that linear logic without exponentials, okay, is decidable. So why is that? <clears throat> Anybody see the argument? The linear logic without exponentials is decidable. Yeah? That's right, we have a finite number of, I mean, that's the idea of the proof. Because we have a finite number of resources, every left or right rule consumes one of those, which means it removes one of the connectives, okay? As we're going up in the proof, we're not allowed to use cut, because cut is the thing that introduces an arbitrary formula into the proof, that A. So that would destroy that argument, we don't have that, okay? And so we eventually have to run out of connectives, because for every inference rules, there's fewer connectives in the premise than there is in the conclusion. Anton, is that what you, what you were going to say? You have to find a number of choices, and each choice reduces the number of connectives because the left and the right rule always remove one connective. Okay? It's still, you know, complexity of it is quite high, okay? Because for the and right and the or left rule, you duplicate delta, right? 
it goes to both premises. Okay, so it's not a trivial thing, but it's definitely decidable because in each premise there is one fewer connective than in the conclusion. So eventually you'll have to run out of things to do. Okay. Okay, so it's decidable, which is nice. Of course, if we have bang, it turns out to be again uh, a, a question whether it's decidable or not. Um, so now we have to change our theorem. Okay, and the way we change our theorem is this way. Um, so we add a gamma here, and we add the same gamma here, and that's a matter of convenience. Okay, and then we have a gamma in the conclusion. Okay, now I make these three gammas the same. Because if they turn out to be different, okay, I can weaken the sequence and put in additional stuff to make them the same. So and this is because if I have a proof, okay, remember in a proof, gamma always gets propagated unchanged from the conclusion to the premises, right? Gamma is always propagated to all premises. And so if, I, if these are not the same, this is gamma one, this is gamma two, I take the things that are here missing from there and vice versa and just add them to the other proof and they're never used. I can't do that in the linear case because everything must be used exactly once. But for these persistent resources, they don't have to be used. So adding that to the proof is okay. So then I get to a situation where I have the same things here and here. Just makes it easy to prove. Okay. It's not necessary, but it's a convenient way to do it. Okay. So, um, so what we want to prove admissible, if I write it here, is this rule. Okay. One thing to note about adding something, it doesn't change the structure of the proof. Right? Because you just add it in in every sequence, but you don't change the proof. So any kind of induction that you want to do, you can add unused formulas. It doesn't change your induction measure. Okay, so that's, that's useful to remember. Okay, so now we need to look at the new cases and see. Well, first of all, the cases that we already have, okay, they kind of don't really change. Okay? Because if it's like, um, if you have a tensor right here with a tensor left, you do the cut reduction, and it doesn't matter about gamma. That's just along for the right. It doesn't change. Okay. So basically, because gamma is added systematically everywhere, we don't have to change really the cases we already have. Okay. So that's nice. Okay. We don't have to change that. Um, but what we have to worry about now are the new rules. Okay. What happens with them? Okay. So what are the new rules? Bang left, bang right. There's bang left and bang right. So let's write those. Uh, gamma empty proves bang A if gamma proves A. Uh, the bang left gamma semicolon delta comma bang A proves C if gamma A delta proves C bang left. Okay. And the copy rule. If we have a Obviously, you might expect that the crux of the argument is going to be in the copy rule. Okay. Um, but let's see what happens. Um, the first thing we want to check is the check that, that we did before when you have a right rule for connective meets the left rule for the connective, right? which is the cut reduction. So if this right rule meets this left rule, what happens? So we want to reduce it to a cut of the smaller formula, right? But the problem is, how do we get rid of a copy of something in gamma? Okay. Okay. So we need to generalize our induction hypothesis. So this becomes part i. Okay, part two i. If gamma and no linear assumptions, you have a cut-free proof of A, and gamma with A in there and delta prime, we can prove C. Then gamma um, and delta prime, we can prove C. OK, we need to generalize our induction hypothesis to account for this new possibility. Okay. Um, 
So we had this before when we talked about the concurrent process interpretation because this was one of the <coughs> ways that a process can be composed in order to realize something that's uh, uh, supposed to be persistent or shared. Okay. Um, okay, so what we said here is that persistent assumption A can be realized by being able to supply as many copies as A as you want because you don't depend on any linear resources, only on resources that themselves are persistent. So therefore, this cut principle makes sense because persistent truth is explained in terms of ephemeral truth without using any assumptions. Therefore, you can copy this proof. And that has to be now contained in our meta proof here that this, that this theorem holds or that this other cut rule is admissible. Okay, so the good news is that matches the premises of these two things. In fact, that's how you can come up with it if you want. So check, okay? So we have pushed the thing ahead of us, right? You hope that we don't actually come from the other side and have to push it back towards us. Right? Okay, so, um, so we, can, we can do that. So we can take a cut at bang A, and we have to reduce it somehow to a cut bang at A. Okay. Right. The cut, if you call this thing cut bang and this thing up there cut, you know, then the new cut is at a smaller formula, but it's a slightly different kind of cut. Are we okay in this? So if you cut this with that, you just apply it to the premises. The formula gets smaller, but it's a different kind of cut. So we want something to become smaller in this. Okay. All right. So now we have to worry about um, the, this kind of cut here. Okay. This with this. So let's look at this, at this particular thing on the board. What happens here? Um, how do we analyze the possible cases? But we always want to do it so that we don't have to consider all n squared cases, right? Okay. Um, all right. So how do we do this now? Okay, so there could be a copy rule in this proof. Uh, we don't want to look at that. That's nasty. Because then in the premise, we have something in here. We can't apply the induction hypothesis, drat. So hopefully we don't need that case. Okay. What else could be applied here? Well, A could be introduced by some kind of a right rule. Okay. That's nasty because it's different from the A over here. We can't apply the induction hypothesis. So we don't want to consider that either. So we don't want to consider this at all, right? Let's not change D. Okay. Okay. Fix D. Let's look at this proof over here. How does this proof proceed? Okay, so it could be anything really. What happens if there is a left rule applied to something in delta prime? Can you see that without me writing it down? Right, so what happens is that if this is the left rule in delta prime, gamma and A are propagated to all premises, right? And so then we apply the induction hypothesis with this D, which we don't change. So let's call this D. To all the premises, cutting out that extra copy of A from each premise, and then reapplying the rule. So it's the same as pushing the cut up in the proof. Can everybody see that without me writing it down? Okay. Yep. What if you apply a right rule to C? The C could change in some cases, but that's all right because C is not part of our induction metric. We just reapply the rule. If you apply a right rule to C, let's say a tensor, and so this is being split up into two pieces. There's C1 over here and C2 over there. <laughs> yeah, the delta gets split into two ways. We cut H, A out of the, each premise by induction hypothesis, and we just put it back together with the exact same rule that we had before, now only with just gamma instead of gamma and A. So we just push it up. Okay, great. So one case only that demands any thought. Copy, right? Because the only thing that can happen to A is that it gets copied. Otherwise, it just gets propagated along everywhere. But A might be copied, so we have to count for that. OK, so the only interesting case is if we have gamma, no linear assumption, proof A. So that's D. And we don't want to touch that. Touching it is bad. Okay, 
And this is E, where this premise is some kind of like E prime. Uh, and this was, was it delta prime? Yeah, for some reason I wrote this delta prime. I guess to be consistent with the previous line. Okay, so this is a scary, scary case. And the only case that requires any thought, okay. Okay, how do we do this now? So we have to, before we had one copy of A, now we have two copies of A. So that's the scary part of this, right? Because we didn't have to worry about this before. Mm, okay. So we def if we can somehow cut out the persistent copy of A, yeah. then the first part holds, right? Okay, so, so let's cut, it, cut out the persistent copy of A. What do we get? We get gamma together with delta prime and A proof C by um, cut bang of A applied to um, all of D, right? We don't change that, and E prime, right? So that seems okay because the cut is the same, the cut formula is the same, the D is the same, just the E gets smaller, right? Seems okay so far. So we get this thing. Now the problem is that this proof here might be very large, very, very large, right? Because the result of applying cut elimination might be larger than what you start with, okay? But of course, the reason we had this thing being empty is that we can now take D and cut out that A. With one. Yeah, with part one of the induction hypothesis, right? Okay, so if we did this right, then this is empty, so it gets added in here, but it doesn't add anything. So we get gamma delta prime proves C by a cut, an ordinary cut on A on D and some humongous potentially thing, which is the output from the induction hypothesis, right? Which is this thing. This we are doing was F prime. Or, yeah, okay. Okay, and is that what we needed? Hopefully that's what we needed. Uh, let's see. So if you do the cut bang between these two, the A drops out, gamma goes down, delta prime in C, yes. So that's what we need. Okay, so we can construct the right thing, but why does it terminate? What gets smaller in that cut? All right, so now we have to think about this. Any suggestions? You can order the cases in the hmm? You can think the cases of the theorem for part of your ordering. Okay. So we have to incorporate somehow into our induction measure an ordering between these two forms of cut, which corresponds to case i and 2i, right? Okay. So, um, okay, so let's think about this. So here, in this case, with the bang right and the bang left rule, we get, get a cut of bang A to a cut bang of A, so the formula gets smaller. So let's put the formula on the outside. So nested induction again. Okay, first on A, okay? So that takes care of this because the formula A gets smaller, right? In both cases, if you consider them mutually recursively. Um, okay, now here, the formula stays the same problem, but we go from cut bang to cut. So maybe we can think cut is actually smaller than cut bang. Okay, so intuitively, um, so, Cut bang is strictly larger than cut, okay? That would be second. Um, okay, another way to say that is that sort of case 2i can appeal to case i, okay, without making the cut formula become smaller, okay? That's the same thing as saying cut bang is larger than cut. So we can appeal to the induction hypothesis on the first part without making a smaller. Um, as long as something else gets smaller when we go from one to two, right? Because they call each other recursively. So what would be the third part here? That's what we used to have down there, right? The formula stays the same, the cut of cut stays the same, and one of the two one of the two proofs gets smaller, the other one stays the same. So that would be the pair, D comma E, 
okay, get smaller in the way that I just described. Okay? So now you just have to check all the cases and you'll see just the way I went through here that this is a valid lexicographic ordering. Okay? So either the formula A gets smaller, okay, and that happens when a left rule meets a right rule, okay, including this one, which is important. Okay? Um, or the formula stays the same, but then the kind of cut becomes smaller because um, we have to consider an ordinary cut to be smaller than a persistent cut. Or the formula and the kind of cut stays the same, and then um, the, the uh, derivations get smaller. One gets smaller, the other one stays the same. Okay? That's it. Okay. So this is actually, um, it's hard to really fully appreciate how simple this proof is unless you have tried proofs for nonlinear logics. Okay. Um, but it turns out to be very neatly separate out all these sort of interfering issues because, because everything is linear, the proof of the linear part is very, very simple. Okay. And because duplication is isolated just in one place, just in the copy rule, in all of the rules, everything gets obviously smaller. Okay. You just have to worry about this one case and all you need to notice is that this cut can be considered bigger than this one and you're done. Okay. Um, so, um, if you have been in the trenches of proof theory, some of you have, okay, uh, you should appreciate how simple that particular kind of proof is, okay. Um, okay, so what we have proven now is that that lemma, and we already proved before that lemma holds, that means if something has a proof with cut, then it has a proof without cut, okay. And that lets us now conclude the thing I did started the lecture with, that in fact is not, not the case that implication distributes over or. Okay. It cannot distribute over or because we looked at all the possible ways to do a proof and there is none. Okay. There's other things one can prove now as a consequence. For example, um, if I want to convince you that our logic is consistent. Okay. Now consistency is not such a super interesting property here but it basically means that you cannot prove a contradiction unless you have already contradictory assumptions. Okay. Now why can't we prove that? Whoops. Why can't we prove that in linear logic? I gave the proof away, of course. So we cannot argue on this provability relation because it could have been a cut with a clever lemma okay, that we can prove from no assumption and that lemma improves contradiction. But now we know, obviously, if this were the case, okay, then there would also be a proof of that by our theorem. How many proofs of that can there be? Well, what rule could be applied? None, because we don't have a right rule for zero. We only have a left rule. So no rule applies. So immediately, this cannot be proven. So if we know cut elimination, we know what's traditionally called the logic is consistent. We cannot prove a contradiction in it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, something else we know, so for example, if you can prove from no assumptions A plus B, then either we have to have a proof of A, or there has to be some kind of a proof of B. Okay? Um, of course, if you allow assumptions, this is not true, right? If you have an assumption that says B plus A, and you're trying to prove A plus B, you have to first distinguish cases on B plus A, and then you know which case to go. Right? But if you have no assumption, then you can always either prove this one or this one. And how do we know this? Okay, we know that this sequence with cut, then we also know there has to be a proof without one. There's only two possibilities for the last rule applied. It has to be an injection on the left or an injection on the right. In one case, we have a proof of A. In the other case, we have a proof of B. This is actually an important theorem for something we'll do later when we do functional interpretation of proofs because it essentially says that if you have a canonical value of type A or A plus B, okay, then it either must be an injection left of a value or an injection right. Okay. So it characterizes the values of a given type. But in order to know that, you need to know something about the proof theory of the sequence to know what the proofs look like. Okay. Um, okay, and so there's a bunch of things now that Christina asked about last time. How do we know that certain things don't interact? 
Okay. And the answer is, now that we know that cut elimination holds, we can try to construct a proof of it. And we know if you consider all the possibilities for applying rules and we fail to construct one, we know that it cannot interact. You know, something cannot be a theorem. And these are just two very simple examples. The thing I did at the beginning of the lecture was a slightly more complicated one. Okay. Okay, so now in the next lecture, okay, we'll look in more detail now. We have already usually reduced the set of possible proofs, right? We have reduced it from tremendously huge and large and uncontrolled, okay, to just large and uncontrolled, okay? And now we're going to look further into details on how proofs can proceed and try to limit it further in or order to have a really efficient, well, okay, I shouldn't say that, okay. No, I shouldn't say really efficient when you were in the room, Jamie. Okay. Um, I should say uh, a, a reasonable procedure for finding proofs. Okay. Um, and uh, it'll take some work. We're, not, we're, we're quite some ways away from that. Okay. Um, but because the problem is that if we have, okay, so if you have a large delta, there are many possible um, formulas that you might apply left rule to. It might be a right rule to A. So there's some non-determinism there. Okay, we can, we'll work with that. The other problem is that at any point in time, you could copy a formula from gamma. And that's a scary part, right? Because it doesn't have anything, you know, that duplicates the formula. So you, if you have even a single formula here, right, you can spawn as many copies as you want into delta and apply lots and lots and lots of rules to them, right? And so you get stuck in a morass of being able to copy things out of delta. Um, so, a lot of work will have to go into sort of making sure that we can limit what we can copy from delta. Okay. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, so, I mean, even if, when, if we put the copy in relation A1, because of the copy rule, I don't think it's quite obvious that during the proof stage, we, we know when to stop copying. Exactly. Right, you don't. And in fact, giving it away, linear logic, even the propositional case without any quantifiers, turns out to be undecidable. Okay. So in ordinary logic and intuitionistic logic, or in classical logic, intuitionistic logic, it's very easy to see that the propositional part, if you don't have any quantifiers, it's decidable. Okay. And linear logic without um, uh, persistent assumptions is also decidable. But once you introduce the bang, it becomes undecidable. Okay. So that's why I certainly shouldn't have said efficient, which I really didn't mean to say, okay? Because the problem that we're trying to solve is still undecidable, so, you know, there's going to be some issue, some real issue there, okay? <laughs> um, but there's some interesting fragments which turn out to be decidable, but the decidability proofs are hard. So I will actually show you um, at some point, maybe after the next lecture, the proof that this thing is undecided, that, uh, that even the propositional part of linear logic is undecidable. Okay, because the proof is actually, it turns out not to be very hard. So that would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, and basically, you can see that the problem has to be isolated in the copy rule, right? Because, like, if you didn't have the copy rule, I already argued before that it has to be decidable because you eliminate one connective every time. So it's a duplication in that rule which creates the problem. All right, so we'll see you, let's see, today is Wednesday. Okay, see you next week. And for those who handed in hard copy homework, you can pick it up here.